Shooty, let's go! Um, all right, so a lot of you folks out there probably don't know what an 0306 is or even what a gunner is, even if you're in the Marine Corps. So today I think we're going to do something a little different. We have been blessed with Mr. Jeremy Barone's presence. That's how you pronounce your name, right? Jeremy Barone. Um, and Jeremy here is a gunner in the United States Marine Corps, and uh, I want everybody to have a, a better understanding and and be able to just have situational awareness on what a gunner does. Because a lot of people in the military don't even know. Um, but they do serve an integral role, especially in the Victor units. They're like a direct aid to the battalion commander. Um, they do a lot of stuff. Obviously, you're going to speak on that more than me because I'm not a gunner. But um, again, I do appreciate you taking the time to come sit down and, and talk with me and, and discuss like what it is that you guys actually do um, in your job field. So. Yep. Well, I appreciate the opportunity. Um, it is kind of a niche uh, role, yeah. Um, but it is if you if you find yourself in that position that you can compete for that and get selected, it is it is pretty rewarding and it's pretty impactful. Impactful. Yeah. Now, what is the process? To, how do you actually become a gunner? You have to be a gunny, right? Yeah. So, so the the Marine gunner, the O three O six, comes from uh, just four feeder MOSs. So the O three sixty nine. Okay. Leader. Right? Yeah. Um, the reconnaissance gunnery sergeant. The Marsoc got resurgent, and the LAR got resurgent. Okay, I'm not going to do all the MOSs, but yeah, yeah. 0321, 0317, and 0363, something like that. Yeah, yeah. Like those four fields, um, and then you have to be a gun resurgent. Uh, and the minimum requirement currently is a gun resurgent for one year. Um, for one year. For one year. Is there a minimum time and service requirement? No, just just the grade. Okay. Uh, but the reality is, what that boils down to currently is most gunners. Um, are probably getting it around 14 or 16 years in service, so okay. as late as 18. Um, and that's that's just because it's extremely competitive. Yeah. We got about 104 BICs uh, across uh, 104 spots. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I know you know what a BIC is, but yeah. uh, in the service. And then um, every year we assess or select uh, typically between 20 and, and 10, and sometimes less. Uh, my class was seven guys. Jeez. Class is as low as four, right? Yeah. Uh, and then how many... Gunnery sergeants or master sergeants, first sergeants put in packages, you know, can be 40, 50, 60. Uh, that's right. In that sense, it's fairly select. So when they get selected for the gunner, when when their gunner package gets selected, then they have to go to the basic warrant officer course, right? Yeah, 100% correct. Yeah. What's that called? So first thing that happens is all all warrant officers, so all the all the warrant officers are all warrant officer ones. Yeah. And then Marine gunners who are automatically CWO2s, and oh. career recruiters, which is a tiny niche MOS, oh, okay, for you down the road, yeah, uh, is also CWO twos. Mm. So they all go to the basic school and they do a four month uh, POI called India Company. Okay, right, school. yeah. Uh, starts uh, the commission February one and then goes four months from there. Is that um, uh, called IWOC or something? no? That that's just the TBS. That's all the warrant officers. Okay. And then upon that graduation, the gunners stay at TBS. They do an additional four months at Infantry Weapons Officer Course, and that's headed by the TBS gunner. Okay. So one of his collateral duties is he's the director of IWAC. So okay, so you, so you got WOBIC. WOBIC is yeah. the warrant officer basic course. Yeah, yeah. After WOBIC, if you're going the gunner's path, you go to the gunner's course yeah, right after that. Yep. How long is the gunner's course? Four months. So eight four months? months what what kind of things are, are <laughs> folks learning when they go through the gunner course? Well, I, I would tell you a couple of things. I, I'd first say that, that I don't think... And it's a phenomenal course run by phenomenal Marine gunners. Uh, yeah. Currently, Gunner Earhart has is, is got the basic school, and, and he's in charge of that. Okay. Um, but it is, I would offer, it's a finishing school, right? Because the, the real thing that's going to make a gunner capable, in my mind, is the experience. And that's why we're looking for a gunny with at least one year as a gunny, but but often, like I said, more. Yeah. It's the experience in the FMF, outside the FMF, and the sporting establishment as an instructor, uh, time on rifle ranges, those, those kind of different things that he can offer value as he goes, but then what he's getting it at, uh, what he's getting at, uh, I walk is he's getting, uh, you know, an education in, um, and, and all the things he's got to do as a Marine gunner, whether that's dealing with ammo, whether it's how to, how to look at training, how to vet the training, how to deal with commanders, uh, or interact or support commanders. <laughs> uh, I um, no, I understand. And, and, yeah. And, uh, and, and everything 
else. I, I would tell you that um, I've been to a number of marine schools. Yeah. And the, the trend that I found was it was always great information, but it was always kind of late, if that makes sense. Right. They're like career courses and staff are like, this is good gouge. I wish I'd known this earlier. Yeah. Um, as an example, I think that's fairly common. I did not feel that uh, in 14 when I went through I walk. I think that the stuff that the gunner there at the base school at the time gave us was extremely impactful. And then when I went to the FMF as a new gunner, uh, I didn't know all the answers. But when someone said, hey, I have a problem with Tamas, I was able to go, well, okay, hold on. Let me get back to you. And, and I might not have the answer right then. I at least knew what they were talking about. Yeah. Uh, so I think I walk, like I said, back in 14 was very good and it's only improved. Mm. As it goes. So the the actual MOS is, is called, what's the actual MOS referred to as like in, you know, uh, like based on like the MOS designators called yeah. infantry really, weapons officer, inf infantry yeah, weapons so officer. So it's 0306, right? As you said, infantry weapons officer. And then that it's a little, and I don't know if I can even explain this well, but, but I am a Marine gunner. Yeah. Right? So I'm a Marine gunner and there's all sorts of other uh, chief warrant officers, warrant officers, and they're, they're not, they are yeah. warrant officer four. And then they have their MOS as vital as it is. Yeah. Uh, but, but my proper title is gunner. Okay. Um, so on the promotion warrant, it says Chief Warrant Officer 4, and then in, in parentheses, Marine Gunner. The easiest way I can equate it to is from an enlisted side, we don't call a sergeant an E5. Yeah. Oh, I'm a sergeant. So okay. Pay grade is E5, so I'm currently a uh, C-004. Okay. So my pay grade is 04, but you wouldn't call me Chief Warrant Officer 4. No. Call, I mean, you could. but be but weird. I'm, I'm, <laughs> it would be weird. Um, <laughs> It'd be weird. But I'm, I'm, a, I'm a gunner. Okay. And, and, you know, enlisted Marines call you sir, and that, that's super... Uh, obviously super appropriate, but I don't know any gunners, and I certainly, I just prefer gunner. Yeah. It works well at all levels. Yeah, and you guys are the only ones that wear the bursting bomb on, right. on which side of your collar? The left side. The left side. Is there a specific reason why it's the left side? No idea, although if you look at the, the way the Navy does it, and so that's kind of who we're patting the uniform. Okay, okay, yeah. yeah. Like the chap, or the chaps wears yeah, their cross on that side? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, that makes sense. All right, so when they're just... To recap, when they're in the uh, infantry weapons or infantry, infantry, infantry weapons, weapons officer, officer course, course, when they're in the infantry weapons officers course, officer course, uh, are they relearning and getting peckled out on like every weapon system that the infantry uses again, just to get they, like a refresher they, on they us? They certainly are. Um, now I would tell you that that each director is a little different. I will tell you my experience, and it was pretty well done. Yeah, is what what the gunner at the time did. What what Gunner Gordon Hay had us do is he he looked at at me, for example, background of Middle 311. Yeah. And he said, all right, Barone and and a, another extremely talented gunner, well, not extremely talented, like Gordon Hay was talented, not like me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> another, a, a very, you know, one of the other students, uh, a friend of mine, John Costa. Okay. He said, Costa and Barone have missiles. And then Costa and Barone taught missiles, toe and, and, and jab, mm. to the other gunners. We all fired. We all peckled out. We all fired them, obviously. Okay. Um, and then Gunner Hay was there to, to backstop us as a very senior gunner. And obviously, you know, if you're going to succeed in our court, and you know this, like if, if I have a question about a machine gun, yeah. I might ask another gunner, but I'm just as likely to go find a Sergeant 0331. Yeah. Right. Because that's, you know, you can't know, you can't know everything. I, yeah. I know more about weapons at the surface level than anybody else. Yeah. But I still, I might know more about a certain system than another. And yeah. I, I have that belly button gunner that I might call, or like I said, that non-commissioned officer who I might reach out to for his specialty. Yeah. Um, yeah, I love reaching out to the subject matter experts for some of these things because those. I mean, that's one of the reasons why I think that like cross training is so uh, beneficial, especially if like you have the opportunity to do some machine gun training with some uh, support MOSs, and then maybe we pull or we reach out to one of the other battalions or like, hey, do you guys have a couple of like, you know, sergeant or NCO machine gunners in general that could come over and like teach some machine guns to our guys and that's that's who I would like ask for. I'd be like, hey, right. these guys, they they probably know what they're doing. This right, way. and I think that's not only a best practice, but it's it's a it pays both ways, right? So yeah. You get you get your your Marines or the whatever the specialty is that they're trying to learn, whether we being cross trained. Yeah. They get better training, but then that Marine, in this case, the machine gunner, O three thirty one corporal, gets to show his knowledge base, makes him feel uh because he's got it, but uh, yeah. a sense of self worth. And it just, it balances out yeah, yeah. Or, or pays you on both sides. Yeah. And you know what? I, I, I've found that you actually retain the information more or more effectively or more efficiently when you're teaching stuff over and over again. You, it's like getting re-ingrained in your brain, your brain, you know? Um, 
Yeah, hundred percent. So, all right. So you guys go over like saber, the tow missiles, the javelin stuff. Every you... weapon in the inventory, every optic in the inventory. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, that the and that that's important. Um, yeah. But as it as it continues, I feel bad. I should, we should have Gunnar Earhart tell you what what TBS uh, <laughs> it's, it's program, not mine. Yeah. But um, but uh, you know, so uh, range design, right? Because you, you think about as, as a as a battalion gunner, you, you're you're forward deployed uh, to you know outside the continental United States, and mm. you know battalion commander, BLT commander, MU commander um, likes to see you know wants to see company attacks. How do you design that? How do you integrate all those combined arms? How do you do that safely, effectively? But more importantly, uh, you know, to, to provide that combined arm solution, um, understanding of of the you know the 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 DA PAM uh, range safety regulations, yeah. how to and how to once again use those to your benefit to maximize the training for the Marines. Um, uh, I, yeah, I could kind of go on. I mean, it's I you you'll forgive me. It's four months of of like those uh, a gunner going to school. He's going to be that that four months. He's going to be he's going to learn quite a bit, but he's going to work very very hard. Yeah, that's actually kind of the. That's kind of the fun time because that's yeah. the time you're worried about you. After that, it's all about the battalion. Yeah, that makes sense. Do you do you so when you when you come back? So say for example, when you become a brand new gunner out of the infantry weapons officer course, and you go back to the fleet, do you typically go straight to an infantry battalion? Ideally, that would be the model, right? The model okay. is that um, is that a guy gets a battalion first. Okay. Um, the reality is with our population uh, is that there's other uh, there's there's other initial billets that have to get filled. Okay. So there are, there are ranges uh, both down in Paris Island, uh, down in MCRD San Diego, uh, that are two bics. There are uh, common engineers is a two bic. So there's you know there's about thirty plus two bics. Mm. So we not everybody gets that chance. The reserve battalions are three bics, but sometimes a two will go there for first time. Yeah. Um, the goal is is ideally we get every gunner gets battalion time as a two. Or a three, yeah. Doesn't get as a two, um, and I think we've been very successful with that. Um, but but I would tell any gunner that the job is to be a battalion gunner. Okay. Like I'm currently in a regiment, and that's that's great. But that's all gravy. That the if, as a marine gunner, where I was impactful, where I mattered the most, and where I was of most service to the to the service, was as a battalion gunner. Yeah, that's the job. And when you're when you're when you are in that position of battalion gunner, like you said, you guys, do you guys actually work with like the companies or the company commanders of de for designing ranges for them and stuff like that? Or like helping them establish SDZs for ranges and things like that? Or Right. Well, I would tell you that, that uh, a battalion gunner uh, works with everybody in the battalion. Everybody. You know, you're like, it's 880 souls, right? So, yeah. Um, but the reality is, uh, at least my reality, yeah, was I had phenomenal battalion commanders. But I didn't talk to those Marines, those officers very often hmm. because the reality is they know the infantry and they are busy. Hmm. Company commanders talk to them often, but I tell you who I spent the most time with, hands down, the lieutenants and the staff sergeants and really the lieutenants hmm. because that's the guy you think about your company XOs, you right. think about the, the rifle team commander. Those are the people who serve as the OICs. Those are the people who are designing the, the, the although they may, may not be approving, they're taking the battalion commander's guidance uh, and then they're disseminated down the company commanders. Company commanders got a vision of what's going on. Who's coming up with the teep with the training plan? Yeah. Uh, well, maybe not the teep, but the but the quarterly training plan. That's yeah. The company XOs. They, you know, ideally they've got one deployment underneath their belt. They've got a lot of good ideas. But how do we how do we get this manageable? I have a friend who used to say, uh, "Throw hand grenades from uh, from helicopters." Right. How do we get to the? <laughs> how do we get to the yes? How do we yeah. get to that? So so. But I think if a gunner's you know. Uh, I mean, he should be interacting with everybody. He should be able to talk to a private first class about how he's, you know, how he's loading his rifle, you know, how he's inserting a magazine yeah. to a machine gun section leader, how he's employing that section, training that section to the battalion commander on uh, on what direction the battalion's going, are they following his intent, and what rudder steers he needs. There's a lot. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot on an 05 battalion commander's plate. Yeah. Um, and, and so when you look at the way the service is set up, there's a deliberate reason there, that an infantry battalion has a gunner, and it's to, to take that to take some of that burden or, or maybe uh, flatten those com lines of communication and take his intent yeah. and, and get it out there. Yeah. Now, I, you guys are also responsible for like ammo allocations and like figuring out what your ammo allocation for the entire unit is typically for like yeah. a year. Well, I mean, uh, Battalion Gunner doesn't determine his allocation. Uh, that that comes from uh, from from a higher power, if it were. Okay. But, but, but 100%, right? So 
he oversees the 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 unit's allocation for the year. Okay, he oversees so, it. So you know, there, it's it's an MOS, right? Uh, ammunition's an MOS, and 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 what those Marines understand very very well is the proper procedures um, of handling ammo, handling and movement. Mm. Um, and it's a phenomenal MOS. But when you look at a battalion, uh, it rates a chief and then two two uh, two other Marines, and then often they only have they're gaffed one of those. Okay, so there's two uh, ammo Marines, maybe three. Yeah. in the battalion if, if everybody's there. And then that, that senior Marine's typically a sergeant. So when you think about that level, mm-hmm. and of course his boss is a is a is the you know the S three alpha. Yeah. So a second lieutenant typically. Yeah. Right. So you can see <laughs> so the gunner's not an ammo guy, but that's a guy who who has his expertise and and then how do I how do I smartly effectively use that to maximize their training? So he as you said, oversees the allocation. Mm. And then how do I coach teach mentor um the unit on hey we we've got uh, I, I don't know, I'll give you a, a, I'll give you the tiny, tiniest example, but, yeah. but machine gun ammo, for example, I, a typical 302 company grade officer is going to be very interested in using his machine gun ammo to yes. support a platoon attack. Yeah. He's like, this is going to be great. We got 800 rounds per run, and this is really going to let them learn about the effects of, of suppression and then shifting and ceasing. Yeah. And I'd argue, well, the problem is our machine gunners, the two, the teams, right? That Lance Corporal maybe that corporal team leader, maybe that Lance Corporal team leader, they need more reps on gunnery and applying the fundamentals of gunnery. And then I can probably teach that shift C stuff with 100 rounds. And I probably take 700 of that rounds and I go to a range just machine gunnery and I get really good at hitting the target and shifting onto interest, yeah, searching, traversing, and, and, and using machine gun fires. Mm. So that would be a, a small example of, well, yeah, but at IOC, I had all this. Well, at IOC, you did have that. But okay. now at IOC, we're now in the fleet. And so now we've got a different different goal. So that's, if that makes sense, kind of sense. Yeah, no, it makes sense. I, so you're kind of responsible for making sure that the ammo gets spread loaded throughout the entire workup and deployment. So that way yeah. you, you have maximize. enough, maximize, maximize it. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, because everybody's going to be trying to plan training. Everybody's going to gonna want to plan ranges. And every platoon commander is going to have all kinds of good ideas for all sorts of awesome training that they're going to teach your guys how to be great, awesome war fighters with. But um, you got to be like, all right, this is some things that this is feasible for right now, but we're all going to need to maintain this much for ITX, this much for this field op, this much for this field op. Um, and that's a lot, that's a lot to manage just in that one thing is a lot to manage. Um, is there, is there like a fiscal side that you have to deal with as a gunner or is that not something you have to deal with really? Uh, no, no. Okay. No, well, that's a blessing then. No, I, no, I, nope. okay. no, I mean, you, I think you have to be, um, cognizant of, of the the commander's O and M funds, yeah. Um, and you you have to really if there's a fiscal there's a there's probably two components fiscally. One is that is that although you don't own the weapons, yeah, you are the infantry weapons officer. So we talk about uh, you know advising the commanders on, on the maintenance cycle of those. Okay. Of right that the SL three required what is what is necessary, what is not necessary. Accountability of those that you're not accountable for that anymore. You know the ammo. Yeah. But but armory procedures that you know I mean they that kind of once again, not because it's your job necessarily, but because who else has got the experience and perhaps the bandwidth to look yeah. at that. Um, and then um, what What oftentimes, sometimes a commander has, you know, he has his operational management funds, kind of his his discretionary funds. And there may be items that, that a gunner might think, if, if I can get this piece of kit, if it's authorized for the battalion, it will make me more lethal. So you may have that. And I've, I've been involved in that with this thing will make your your unit better, sir. Okay. It will cost this much. And then he rack and stacks that among all of his other priorities, you know, as a commander. Yeah. That's the only time I've ever dealt with. Uh, so you can plant those seeds and be like, hey, there's this piece of kit that's going to make your your you team believe, more lethal. If you believe that to be the case, you certainly can. It depends. Uh, you, optics and weapons, no, right? Because that comes through Syscom. Yeah. Body armor, protective equipment, no. But outside of that, like a pouch or something. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. So I feel like there was a like a specific mount for the PBS 31s that everybody gets issued or something like mm-hmm. that, like a specific mount for the Kevlar or for the helmet, like the Mitch helmets. You'd be like, Hey, this right, this piece of gear is a little bit lighter than the other version. Uh, it's going to make it, it's going to be less weight for everybody. It's only going to cost this much or whatever. And it's a little more durable than the previous kind or whatever. Some, some like that, I guess that's what I think of. As far as the way you're describing, yeah, it's I mean, not from Syscom. It, it's a it, that's SL3, so there's, you're probably on a you're probably in the gray area, and I'd have to talk to myself. Oh. Uh, <laughs> but but I but I would say that that uh, yeah, 
Yeah, I would say that. I would say a, a, a real clear, clean example would be, um, I, I would say back in the day that it's no longer authorized, but but uh, like the, the uh, or I would just say this, like the clear example would be like a grenade pouch, like a smoke. Okay, yeah. That's a very simple, that thing was not issued to the service. Okay. Um, but if you've ever run around with a smoke grenade, you know. Uh, dangling off. Dangling, yeah. like yeah. eventually it'll unscrew and it's on the ground and then you don't have that anymore. Yeah. So, it would be cool to have a costume. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. And so, like, maybe, like, or tactical gloves or something like that. Like a random, yeah. 100%. Yeah, I think that that was something we did one year. Is we, the whole battalion got issued tactical gloves, so we had to turn them back in afterwards if they got shredded or something like that. But that makes sense that that was probably, or potentially was a, a gunner's initiative, maybe. maybe. I, I would guarantee you. Yeah. You were in, you were in uh, third, uh, third Marines 2-3? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I guarantee it was probably Smith. Yeah. Okay. Smith. I but I mean, but yes, you know what I mean? Or yeah. It was probably a regimental gunner, division gunner, or maybe the battalion gunner. Yeah. Uh, it's cool if you can get hired to pay for it. That's the trick. Yeah, that is, that is a, I yeah. had a really good idea once as a regimental gunner, and then I told the division gunner, and he's like, that's a really good idea, and then he did it for the whole division. So No kidding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, you can have a lot of, you can have a pretty large impact as a gunner, well, man. Some some of them do, yeah. 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 Now, okay, so battalion gunner, we've kind of go over, gone over that. You obviously must work with the four a lot if you're working with the armory, the armories and stuff like that, you know. You work with everybody. I mean, so yeah. the, the gunner works for the commander. Yeah. He's on the command deck. Yeah. Uh, and it's like a line chart. If you, if you did a TOE, the line chart would have a little dotted line that goes off to the side. Yeah. Um, but day to day, interacting with the three the most. I okay, the three for training, um, yeah. And then, you're, and then you're going down and you're dealing with it. You're going down, I say that because most most barracks or, or most uh, command decks in the Marine Corps have a top deck and a bottom deck. And I'm an East Coast guy as a gunner, so yeah. on the second deck and you go downstairs. But- um. You know, going down, see what the companies are are, are thinking, yeah. um, and then walk over the floor and go, hey, this is what the three is thinking. This is what we're probably missing, and then trying to get ahead of that. And and it's, I I just like it's connective tissue in a lot of ways. Really yeah. Tying. It's connective tissue. Yeah. To just kind of kind of uh, speed the cycle up. We're about to we're about to miss something, um, and everybody does it differently. I'm a big believer. I don't want to work at all. So when I see a problem, I I know whose fault. Yeah. Fast light is I go find that person. Oh, okay. I go, hey, person. Yeah. This is coming your way. Yeah. I recommend you look at this. And then they'll, they'll just crush it. You can just give them a recommendation I, of what you yeah, think go, they can do to fix it. Coming. This is what we did last year. You might want to do this. And then they crush it. And then they like me because they didn't get in trouble. The commander's happy because the thing worked. Yeah. And I didn't actually do anything, which, which that's. It's a secret. Yeah. Don't ever do nothing. Yeah. Don't don't find yourself working. Yeah. Uh, don't work work. I work smarter, work. not harder. Yeah. I, I think I worked. I worked for years and years. I'm, I'm not interested in working. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm not interested you, in actually working. You said you've been in for 24, 26 years. I'm at twenty six in uh, about three months, right? Twenty six. Yeah. Okay. And you're at the regimental level now. What's the big difference you see between a regimental gunner and a battalion gunner? If you had to like oh, no, I, place it's your finger. Battalion gunners work. Okay. Battalion gunners will work yeah. and they work. I just try to help those battalion gunners. Okay, so you can just come down and make suggestions, recommendations. Oh, well, uh, I would offer, if I come down too often and, and make recommendations, suggestions, I don't know if my guys would like me that much. But well, like, hey man, if you need anything, let me know. Yeah, yeah. Or hey, I, I heard you're thinking about this. This is what I... This my I've saw this work with another unit and maybe best practices right because okay. when you think about a regiment uh, as a force provider yeah you look at the first unit ahead and you see that hey they're doing things and they they've got this problem set and this is how they solved it and now an, another you know another battalion's coming on plane and is now going to go do a McCree or, or go do you know chop to a mute and yeah. they're able to go down and talk to that battalion gunner offline and say this is what the last guy did or this is what they're doing there. And this might work. This is how you might want to look at that. Yeah. And, and I, you know, I do that. I, you know, every once in a while I talk to battalion commander, help that that uh, that, that command out if I can, but not often, right? Um, and yeah, but I would tell you that a battalion gunner is where the where the real work is. I'm, That's I'm, where the rubber meets I'm, the I'm road. Kind of like just an, a wise old man. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> a wise old man. Yeah. I definitely I do. I walk around a lot. I I, you know, I you see people training. You offer them, you offer them, uh, offer your thoughts. I. But uh, but yeah, generally speaking, I, my number one job is uh, is to help the battalion gunners in yeah. their job. Okay. Now, how 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 much time did you get to spend as a battalion gunner yourself? I got I got real lucky. I I commissioned in fourteen, and I joined uh, I joined three two. I did two deployments with them, two two UDPs as a okay. battalion gunner, two two SLTEs, two UDPs. Um, so that's uh, it was almost three years. 
Okay. Two, yeah, two, two years, nine months, something like that. Two UDPs with them. And what would the do you think that what a gunner does for a UDP, which stands for Unit Deployment Program, for those of you that don't know, typically UDPs are going out to Okinawa, mm-hmm. right? From my experience. Yep. Um, so you got UDPs, you got MUSE, the Marine Expeditionary Unit, which goes on ship, usually three ships typically, mm-hmm. right? And yeah. they'll go wherever, depending on the the needs of the Marine Corps, like whatever situation is going on currently. Uh, what what do you think the big differences would be between a unit deployment program to Okinawa and like a Marine Expeditionary Unit? Like, would the gunner do, would it be, would there be any significant difference in what kind of roles or responsibilities, daily activities that the gunner's doing if, they, now, if he's on ship? Now, I would tell you that he's, what you're going to find, either one of those deployments, yeah. is that the gunner is is at that point, um, he's, prob- he's probably more FOPs than COPs. So he's more forward, you know, he's, he's, he, Forward action officer, by, yeah. or future action officer than than a current ops. Um, okay, so, I see. What you, yeah, FOPs yeah. meaning future, future operations. Ops, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, okay. Regiments, if they get enough officers to divide up their three shop like that. <laughs> so, so he's got to be able to do both. So you got. Yeah. But what what he's going to find is whether he's on a MU or whether he's on a UDP, um, or wherever he's got to go forward as an advance party, or is it, or is a, uh, uh, or on a, you know. A reconnaissance. There's a fancy military term for it that escapes me. But he's got to go to wherever his unit's going to train. He's got to see the feasibility training. He's got to see what what can be done. He's got to make that recommendation to either the company coming out, to the tune coming out there, the battalion, whatever that level is. Yeah. And then and then interact with that. If there's a range control, interact to get his training scheduled. If there's not a range control, figure out the surface danger zones and what's what's within the realm of possible. So that accounts to every country in the world. Yeah. And it's some. There's either nothing. And you're going from scratch, or it's Fuji, and there's there's a range control, but you're still interfacing with them. Yeah. And then the unit comes on board, do a turnover with that unit. This is what I've got set up for you. This is the ammunition you have for it. This is the training venues in the days. Okay. This is what I recommend that looks like. And then probably probably in an ideal world, see them begin that, and then move to the next place. But okay. oftentimes no. So a mule gunner is going to spend probably about zero time on a boat. Because oh. if he's on the boat, he's not doing his job. Yeah. He's in the ch- line for chow hall. He's not doing, like, the site survey stuff that he would exactly. need to do to actually figure out what the SDZs could be. Yeah. So, like, if, for example, if they were going out to the Southeast Pacific and they were like, yeah, we're going to go to Malaysia, we're going to go to the Philippines, we're going to go to Australia, whatever, you'd be popping into each of those countries with, before like, a forward everybody. party before everybody. Yeah. And oftentimes, setting ranges up. Yeah, oftentimes you'll, you'll see it's probably, like, it's probably a rep from the three. Yeah. Probably a rep from the four. Um, and, and that's probably it. Yeah. The gunner and, 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 it, and it could be, I mean, every, every unit's different. Every gunner's different. Yeah. Um, but I've certainly gone myself to places. Yeah. Um, and, and I, lots of, lots of gunners do. And you set this up and like I said, then, then you're essentially an action officer for that, put a package together, however your unit uh, desires or however they work. Yeah. Um, and then as they, as they onboard, you turn it over to them and go on to the next thing. Interesting. Yeah. Now the, I think something else I think would be interesting that a lot of people probably don't know is what what does a gunner do in combat? Yeah. Um, so I've seen gunners do a number of, of things. So yeah. um, as part of the build description, there is you, you can command task organized units. Okay. So I've seen gunners command uh, platoons in Sangin. Uh, in Sangin. Yeah. No kidding. Uh, I, uh, and and be, you know I. You know, obviously casualties, uh, yeah, whatever. Um, uh, command a platoon and Sangin. I've seen uh, a gunner command a uh, a company and uh, a friend command uh, weapons two eight in two thousand thirteen in in Afghanistan um, as an independent command. Um, I've seen, yeah, I've seen a, a, more than more than one guy command uh, platoons. Yeah, um, a, a, gunner a gunner commanding a platoon. That's that's got to be a very unique. Well, I mean, you you, you think about. Um, I mean, I, I think that the guy, and he was, well, he's an extremely talented officer. Yeah. He's a graduate. He's, he's an infantryman. Yeah. He's a graduate of the basic school. He's a graduate of infantry weapons officer, of course. He's been talking to the battalion commander about training for, for two years. <laughs> yeah. Got, right. I, I think on this case, this gentleman, he's retired, of course. Um, yeah. He, I think it might have been his second deployment as a gunner. I could be wrong. It could have been his first deployment. Yeah. But he's literally, the, he's one of the best Marines, that, like, hands down. So, yeah. like, when you're looking at it, um, like, why would you not? And, and the, the 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 gunner who commanded a uh, weapons company. I was in that battalion as an enlisted marine when he did so, and it was, you know, I mean, it, it was, it, although he's extremely tactically sound, obviously he commanded the company because the battalion commander trusted him as a marine and as an officer first and foremost. Yeah, like that's why he got the company. It's not because 
they needed his expertise. They were already trained. So yeah. They needed that role model, that caliber of, of Marine. Was officer. there just not a captain available at the time? or uh, Not that the colonel trusted. Oh, so he gotcha. One. Okay. One. And then the gunner took the company over, and yeah. the weapons company. The weapons company. That must have been a very interesting situation, having the gunner as your CO yeah. as the weapons company with, like, the head. Did you guys have a mounted, you had CAD at the time, or were they dismounted the whole time? No, this, this was mounted. Okay. So he had 80 once. He had the and he had 80 once. He had two cap platoons. Yeah. He had weapons company. Man, he must have loved that experience. Well, he's, I, I mean, he was a hell of a hell of a marine. So yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, see, that's that's one of the things a lot of folks. I definitely have never heard that. I've never asked anybody that question before. I was always curious, like what gunners and, can and do. I, and now I would say that's not the. I, I, that is not the answer. Yeah, it's just one. So answer, I've, right? I've seen uh, oftentimes gunners. Uh, uh, particularly in Iraq, there was a, there was a common trend that the gunner, uh, not common. Sometimes he were, he could command the the, uh, the commander's PSD. Uh, that's a uh, personal security detachment. Okay, that, that's an option, right? Because you're that way you're not pulling out of hide, pulling a lieutenant out of hide, or, or yeah. Um, I've seen that. Um, I've seen. I had a in in Ramadi in '04. I had a guy named Rick Sam's phenomenal. Uh, I thought one of the reasons I wanted to be a Marine gunner. Yeah. Um, but but Gunner Sam's came out. Uh, with all the companies, all that. So I'm on a squad patrol, and the gunner's with me. No kidding. And, right. So he comes back, and he's going, "Hey, this is this is what Barone's squad is doing, or White One. This is what White One's doing." Yeah. Um, and passing those those across the division gunner, uh, for Second Mardiv, uh, gunner halfway. I know he did the same. He had a battalion and sang, and and he was out patrolling, and then passing it from company to company to company, from platoon to platoon to platoon. And that's probably okay. more that directed telescope. Yeah. Uh, when we talk about it. And then the, the commander, and I don't know if I said that, but directed telescope is kind of tied in that. Some of the commander can go, I'm interested in this, whether it's aspect of training or aspect of combat or aspect of subordinate commanders, whatever. Go take a look at this warning gunner and then come back and tell me what you see. Yeah. Um, and so that's one of one, one of those aspects. Because you could kind of be, well, the gunner could kind of be the eyes and the ears of the battalion commander for him, like forward out doing stuff with, mm-hmm. the, with the squads, with the platoons, with the companies. Uh, and then he can come back and kind of paint a better picture for him if maybe he didn't get the full picture from sure. whoever else was providing after actions or whatever. That's interesting. I didn't I didn't realize that was something like it sounds to me almost like gunners have a lot of freedom to kind of work with the battalion commander on like what kind of things they do in that type of situation. It's unique almost. I couldn't know? agree more. I don't I don't uh, I I could probably count on my on on two hands the amount of times and and. Uh, math and public. I've been a gunner for ten years. Yeah, I've less than less than years that I've had a commander uh, tell me to do something. Yeah, probably not doing so hot. Yeah, if, if an O five or an O six or a general needs to say, I need you to do that. Yeah, it's more about hey, I'm looking at the I'm looking at the the looking at the battle space or I'm looking at the training situation and I think I need to be there. Um, and then I'm there. And then if I think he's going to have a concern with it, then I'm going to let him know. But yeah, just in that normal course of events, hey, I'm going somewhere and. and Typically, what I found is that if, if the gunner is doing, is going out doing gunner things, my my current boss says that go do gunner things. Yeah. If you're if you're going to do gunner things, then then you're that's what the commander needs you to do. Yeah. You know. Um. So I I think sometimes a, a a new gunner will be like a new to the role will be I don't get a lot of counseling from my commander and it's like yeah he's busy and and you know your job, right? He's got his job. You know your job. If you're doing it, if he's not telling you anything, it's probably because you're doing it right. Yeah. I, you know, on the assumption you're out there out there moving and making things happen. Yeah. Now there's a lot of freedom. To answer your question. A lot of freedom. Yeah. See, that's yeah. That seems like there's a lot of independence in that, and you kind of. But at the same time, there's the expectation is also still pretty high because you're the one of one. Yeah. The, you know. I, I'd say there's no. Um, what's What's interesting about about the gunner is that I'm the as a as a CWO two. Yeah. In a battalion, um, I'm I'm the second lowest ranking officer in the battalion because lieutenants yeah. outrank CWO twos. Yeah. The typically a gasso, right? Yeah, the so, gasso, yeah. Right, so that's yep. the guy you typically outrank. Yeah. So, uh, the <laughs> Seaburn officer. So, if you think you want to be a gunner or you are a gunner, but you think you're and you're going to outrank people and make them do it your way because you're the gunner, yeah. Um that that's that's probably the wrong answer. Yeah. And if you think that you're going to make them do it because you have the commander's ear, that's probably the wrong answer too. Yeah. I think that that uh, that uh, you're going to be, you know, with all those years of experience, and the talent that you have with that pool we were talking about, yep. that you got to go for uh, a methodology of of conversion versus compliance. Now there is time, right? If it's a safety issue, or hey, if you shoot that gun this way, it goes off the installation, and like 
you're you're done. Yeah, yeah. And it, I've never heard of a commander if the gunner says I don't think that's a good idea, that that's not, and it involves weapons. That's not happening. Yeah, yeah. Right? yeah. He's going to go. Yeah, and gunner said no, we're not doing that. Yeah. I. Right? But but if you if you want to have a lasting impact on your unit's lethality and survivability in combat, where even you can be as present as you want with 27 rifle squads out there and about, you have to convert them. Yeah. You have to convert them to to what you're thinking and why you're thinking it. And we all know Marines, although we're disciplined, you get a better result out of a Marine if he understands the why behind it. I think yes. that's a huge part about being a Marine gunner. Yeah. When you can take the time to get the why. And then they buy into that. Yeah. And then that then then it becomes the way they've always done it and they love it. And it's a best practice. And off you go. That's see, that's huge. I think you're hundred percent spot on. Like a lot of Marines, like they get frustrated when they're doing stuff that they were tasked to do and they don't nobody ever provided the why. It's like, why are we doing this? Why are we up at three o'clock in the morning to go do this thing that doesn't start till ten? Like, why are we doing this thing or whatever it is? And that, like you said, like you get that buy-in when you're able to provide that. Why are you took the time to be like, this is why these are the methods that we use to approach this particular situation because A, B, and C. And then they're like, oh, okay, I, maybe they didn't know that before. And it's like sure. they're they're becoming more educated in their craft. They're learning more. They're becoming more lethal probably as a result of it. Like. Um, and that's super beneficial. Uh, so how often, if you had to like think back to it, how often did the gunner get to go to the field to supervise ranges that he planned for some of these lieutenants? I, you, there's no one's telling the gunner where to go. So the, 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 he, as often as he like, yeah, get out there as much as he wants as to, much as he wants. Now there's once again, that, 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 cops fops type type of mentality right yeah if if he's running the range which you know you typically don't see yeah. right um then, then now he can't be he can't be other places mm. um but uh but i mean like there's no one if you're doing it right there's no one telling you where to go yeah so, so what i would offer is that is that what a what a gunner what a battalion is probably doing he's probably if he's got a day that only that only uh one unit is training well, that he would go to that, but I would offer he's probably not going to stay there the whole time. Yeah, because at a certain point, once again, right, we we make sure the things on the, the tracks are doing what they said they were going. We had the conversations, then we got the confirmation brief. We told the boss this is what we're going to do. Gunner comes out, he makes sure you're doing what you're supposed to do, and he helps you get on track. Make yeah. sure your your coordination with whomever arranged whatever. Yeah, right. If he sees something cataclysmic, maybe he inter intervenes. Like it, it's not un, untoward, I don't think, on my end as a battalion gunner to go where where are the trucks? Yeah, and like oh, they're not here. It's like did you actually? Did you call anybody? No. It's like okay. Hey, yeah. ask for Alpha. Where, where are the trucks for, for Alpha Company? Yeah. You know what I mean? It's yeah. not my job. Yeah. You know, but let, let's 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 get the unit better. But at a certain point, you know, once it's got, once it's going, you got to step back and move on to something else. And I I think what's the core layer I would have is is any young leader in combat, what, what you'll see a young lieutenant or a young corporal, young sergeant do, is when they they see a problem, they go fix it, which is awesome. Okay. Right? Like I've got a problem. I'm gonna go fix it. Like yeah. we need to shoot at that building. Yeah. And then they start shooting that building. Fighter leader, awesome. Yeah. But that's not your job. So you shoot at that building, and you get a private, and you get that private shooting that building, and then you step out. And so I'd offer a gutter kind of same thing. Oh, oh no, this is not good. Here you go, lieutenant. This is or here you go, staff sergeant. This is how we fix whatever this problem is. Yeah. You see how I did that? Now back off, because if a gutter spends all day on that one range, I mean, may, gunner needs to go where gunner needs to go, but that's yeah. probably not. He then. You know, you want the unit to go and, and make it happen, uh, you know, the company platoon, whatever level, and then go towards the next thing. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Do you do you typically have to sit in in every confirmation brief that's company level and below, or do you just do company level and above confirmation uh, well, briefs? Well, any unit I've ever been, if it was live fire, the 05 commander held it. Any live fire? I, any units I've been. There are different, okay. There are different policies. There, you could be... You could be at a point where units like uh, company commanders can take static, and then we'll go up. But oh, every, I see. What you mean. Every infantry unit I've been in, uh, where every unit I've been a gunner in, yeah. Um, the uh, the the O five took the live fire, yeah. And then like hikes and non live fire was at the company level. Okay, that so makes sense. As a battalion yeah. gunner, I you, you sit in every one of those. Um, yeah, so that's a lot of meetings. No, no, I no no. I mean, when you there are a number of them, but you'll probably get you know a meeting. Depends on the unit, right? Like yeah. a battle rhythm. If let's say the unit's got a battle rhythm where, hey, every this day, every Thursday, that's when they do the live fire confirmation brief. Because you'd like to see those a couple weeks out. That might be a long time, but but I'd offer that the brief. If the first time the gunner has seen the brief is when the colonel has seen the brief, you have done 
messed up. Yeah, you should have seen it beforehand. Yeah, yeah screened several, it several times, right? Because yeah. how do we get the lieutenant? How do we get the OIC? How do we get the gunny or the staff sergeant? How do we get them? Even the company commander. How do we get them to to something that that's going to be presentable and make sense? Yeah. Right. If you're waiting, if I'm the gunner and I wait till they brief the colonel and I don't agree with that idea, I'm out of Schlitz. I can just tell them don't do it. Yeah. Which is that's wrong. Right. I'm supposed to get these guys better. Yeah. I'm trying to help the commanders get them better. The company commanders get them better. So I, I would tell you that I would typically. At a battalion level, and even at the regiment, very little live fire. I'll see that brief probably two times. Like have a conver- have a conversation about it. Hey, you got an event? Let's talk about what you're thinking. Yeah. And then okay, when you got a brief, let's sit down and then give it back to him with thoughts. And then you know, and then so when the colonel looks at you and goes, Gunner, what do you think? You're able to go, thumbs up because you already. Some of those are your ideas, maybe. Yeah. You know <laughs> Some I mean? like, of those are maybe. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think that's what a commander's looking for. Okay. Right? He only, you know, that's that's. I think what they're what they're looking for that yeah one one small way a gunner can offer value yeah so th- I think y- it sounds to me like you guys provide a lot of mentorship for a lot of the junior officers in the battalion because uh, you work with them a lot especially in regards to live fire training um, did, did you did when you were in that position did you just typically be like hey just email me a copy of this whenever you're done with it anytime you're putting one together just so I can take take a look at it or how did you go not, about not the that. Way I did. I, I would say come by. As soon as you know you're going to be an OIC, come by, talk to me. Okay, just and come we'll by to my we'll, office. We'll, we'll talk what range you're thinking, what ammo that makes sense to you, and then I'll tell you you know, how you're all wrong yeah. and where you want to do the training and how many bullets you can have. Yeah. And then I'll say, okay, you know, go make a brief, brother, and then bring it back yeah. as soon as you can, right? And then I'm a face-to-face guy. And then we down okay. over it, I red pin it, I have my thoughts, give it back to you, do that game for a couple times, it, it, d- depending on the event, depending on the seriousness, depending on how sharp the – how long – not sharp because they're all smart. They, they ain't no lieutenant graduate. There are no IOC graduates who are not intelligent. Yeah. Um, however, right, how long has he been doing it? Yeah. Right. How strong is his gunny? How strong is his exo? How strong is his company commander? So how much other mentorship is he getting? Yeah. Um, and then, you know, once it's in a good spot, you know, we go from there. Okay. So just a little bit about, I'm kind of curious about your, like your backstory a little bit, just because it sounds like you've had, I mean, obviously you were quoting or you're talking on a piece about when you were in Ramadi in 2004, like you've been in the Marine Corps for almost 26 years. Over 26. Over Keep trying to shortchange. Over 26, hey, sorry. Hey, Over 26 hey, years. I, 26 so years. That's 19. Months, 17 days. So if you're if you're junior to me, you're a boot. That's 19. Put that in there. You're <laughs> a boot. That's 1998. That. That's not, uh, well, it's December of 97. December of 97. 97. So you were there for, I mean, that's a vast amount of experience. Like, uh, I mean, like I can only imagine like the, the, the things that you've seen throughout the entire time that you've been in. Like, I mean, you were in during nine yeah. 11, you know, you were in right after that. You saw the fervor and the buildup for the, for the push into Iraq and, and Afghanistan. Like, uh, did, did you, I'm curious a little bit about like some of the history, like some of the units that you were in during those earlier days of the GWAT, yeah, sure. um, and like uh, what kind of, what kind of experiences yeah, you had but- with that? Yeah, it was, uh, you know, pretty pretty standard. I'm an 0311. Uh, yeah. So I, I came in, uh, like, the 27th of December in 97. 97. Uh, yeah. So. I was in fifth grade, by the way. Yeah, right. And uh, I'm an old guy. <laughs> yeah. Old guy, right? yeah. Uh, mo- most most dudes in, in the service were, were not alive when I joined. Yeah. Um, like, yeah. Um, That's funny to think about. Wow. They're not, yeah, they're not even, like. Like not if even you're a, if you're a 20 year old rifleman with two years in. Yeah, I was a sergeant and you were born. <laughs> That's so crazy. See. Yeah, it's a it's a and I was yeah. Um, so I did. Uh, I, I joined. I, I got got very fortunate. I was. Uh, I joined Charlie One Five, which is their first unit. Okay. And, uh, and it, as anybody in the service knows, kind of like your first unit uh, for good, good, bad, and different kind of shapes you. And I yeah. was very fortunate. I, I had a great platoon, a great great lieutenants, great you know some really. Impactful staff and or NCOs, yeah. uh, staff and so not so much at that on that on that first one. Yeah. Um. And uh. And then I, I was in four years in Charlie. Did a couple uh thirty first views. So from okay. Over to Okinawa, um. First deployment. Uh. First workup. I was a saw gunner. Uh, deployed as a point man. Um. Did stuff in the Pacific. Came back. Uh. Did another deployment as a squad leader. Corporal squad leader. Yeah. Just like it is now. Like the idea that, you know, the squad leaders are going to be real senior guys doesn't seem to match the man's arm model. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, um, corporal second deployment, uh, and then I, I, uh, I have a kind of an odd career path in that I wanted to be an, an, I wanted to be a commission officer. Really wanted to be an infantry officer. Yeah. Uh, I put in a MESEP package. Was accepted. Um, got accepted. Yeah, I got accepted to MESEP. Uh, I'm not a dummy. Uh, oh. I am kind of a dummy. 
<laughs> but I, I got accepted to MESAP and uh, and uh, the uh, the package uh, or or whatever. Um, then 9-11 happened. So I'm a summer of 01 guy. Oh. So 9-11 happens. And uh, to your question about like, for, like we were, if, if you, you know, anybody who's come back from a deployment, anybody in active duty and you get that, we were in the bathtub. It was a, came back in the summer of 01. Okay. So like I'm a sergeant platoon commander. Right. You know, I got like 30 guys in the formation. They're all going to EAS. We don't have new joints yet. And and I go for a run. Like the squadlers, you have them. Sergeant Barone's going for a run. And I come back. And, uh, you know, I'm grand and grand to come back. And, and I go into my barracks room. And uh, and all of a sudden, there's a knock on the hatch. And I open the door. It's my old platoon commander's now like the company XO. Yeah. Right. Which is, you know, I got a Tuesday. A wise and tend to my room on a Tuesday at 9 30. Yeah. And he was turning on the TV. I turned on the TV and towers were happening, right? Oh, wow. So, yeah. You, you want to talk about like, a, like a, I personally didn't feel very proud. Uh, kind of, you got to feel like you failed. Yeah. I can't imagine what it would have been like being a sergeant in the Marine Corps during that specific Corps, instance. And you're like, man, our job was to protect the nation. Yeah. I kind of punted this one. Yeah. Um, at least that's personally how I felt. No I can understand that, that. There's no validity to that statement. That's just how I felt. Yeah. Um, so we got all ready to go to war. Uh, the battalion did. We we you know immediately we're we're out in the, we're out training. We're getting ready. We were going to go to, we were going to go to uh, it's a country not Afghanistan, but near Afghanistan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then that didn't happen. Right. Um, and then so I executed the MESAP orders because uh, the battalion was going back to back to uh, back to the to do another thirty first meal. Oh, really? So that's what they were slated for. Really? So I, yeah. So that they were oh, executed, wow. So I executed the MESAP orders, and then their orders got after I executed those did MESAP prep and all that. So then they did the they did the invasion. Okay, uh, and that that's a weight on on anybody, right? You, you want to be part of that. Yeah, um, and so you stayed to do that. I, no, I missed it. I was in Misa. I missed. Oh, the okay, invasion. they did the invasion, um, and uh, and then they came back, and then they went uh, then they went back for all F two, and and then at that point uh, I graduated OCS, uh, but but I dropped on request, no Dewey or nothing, just dropped on request. Yeah, and uh, and I asked the monitor forwarders to two five because I figured in my sergeant brain. That well, one five gets replaced by two five. One five's in Iraq for their OIF two. Yeah. So two five will replace them. And so you wanted to be part of that replacement of party. Yeah. Yeah. To to uh, yeah. Which is pretty natural, Sergeant. Yeah. Uh, Eleven. Yeah. Uh, Squadler thing. And uh, Master Sergeant on the end of the line goes, "Double dog, you're going where I send you." A click, and I'm like, "But I got orders to two five. Like, you still got him. Yeah. After I mean, asking for I, him. Well, I think he just that's where he was sending guys. Like, oh, okay. I, I was asking for something very easy. To get there. <laughs> um, and uh, and and I go to golf company. I do a, a deployment as a squad leader, so I got to do a second one as a, a squad leader to Ramadi, uh, two four and and oh four oh five. Okay. Um, got there in September one and and ended that seven months with them. Uh, How was it on, in oh four and oh five? Because I know oh six classically is like the the time frame everybody says that Ramadi was like absolutely insane. The battle of Ramadi. Yeah. 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 I you know I I can't I wasn't there in oh six so I, I can't I can't compare. Yeah. And um, why I would tell you that. That and this is not a great metric. The battalion we replaced two four was alone in Ramadi. One five ripped them out. Two four took. I might get these numbers slightly wrong. I want to think. I, I believe they took thirty one ka and about four to five hundred purple hearts in a battalion and nine hundred men. So that's pretty kinetic for two four. Yeah. We ripped them. We had the whole AO for three months, and then an army unit took the eastern half. Uh, we took seventeen ka and probably three or four hundred purple hearts. So three or four hundred. Purple Hearts, yeah. I mean, I, oh. I, you know, what I mean, like it's yeah. So, um, so I, it was a kinetic deployment to me. Yeah, ha, you know, to I think any combat deployment, they're all different. Every every squad's fight is different. Yeah, you know, I'm sure there's guys who who were in Ramadi who saw a lot more than I saw, and maybe guys who saw less. Yeah, um, everybody's different, but, uh, but yeah, it was pretty. It was rather kinetic, and I tell you, I was I was uh, I, after the first week I'd been in a gunfight, I had a combat action ribbon, and uh, yeah. or I was in in line for a combat action ribbon, and I was like. All right, I'm ready to go. Uh, unfortunately, I still had uh, six months uh, <laughs> and, uh, and two weeks, um, but I lived right. Uh, yeah. And, and you, you kind of, you know, that you think maybe you're not going to, right? Um, which is a dying realization that we're all uh, mortal. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it was pretty kinetic. I, I learned, you know, learned a lot, and I, I brought um, that squad. I brought all those guys home. How old were you when you went there, dude? Math in public. Um, I'm terrible at math dude, in public, yeah, dude. I'm I sorry. Got, I was 28. I was 28. Old. Yeah, I came in a little late. Senior guy, I was twenty-one. Okay, and so and then because the 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 MESEP adventure. Yeah, so I was I was in zone for staff sergeant. 
Oh, okay. Yeah, see, I was 27 when I when I enlisted. It took me a long time to get into Zion. Is it age being a little older? I, 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 I'd like to think... Yeah, three. <laughs> twenty one was an edge. Twenty, yeah, I, it's yeah, it's a little bit of an edge for sure. I was I was the same age as a lot of my sergeants and staff mm-hmm. stars when I came in. It was weird, but I was but I didn't know anything and had no experience, yeah. so I just had to make sure that I stayed. Yeah, you know, I maintained some a good level of humility, so that way I could actually be open minded to learning things. You know, yeah. Well, I'm dumb but trainable, so that's easy for me. I'm, I'm the same way, hundred percent. Yeah. yeah, dumb but trainable. I could I'll learn. I can learn. I'm, yeah. I've, I have the willingness to learn and the open mindedness. Yeah. Um, okay, so you. You did that one deployment in 2004 to Ramadi. Where, 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 what are some um, some other types of deployments? Well, I came done? back. So I came back from that and then uh, stayed with the battalion. Uh, was a staff sergeant, platoon sergeant uh, for the workup, and then a platoon commander on a, uh, a uh, what do you call it? Uh, this was another 31st Mew. Okay. Third 31st Mew. Um, and then I, I, you know, you can't stay in the fleet forever. Yeah. A classic of your move. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I, uh, I went to SOY West. Yeah. Um, and I got uh, I got very fortunate. I, I went to Unit Leaders Course, which is where where they teach uh, staff sergeant, platoon sergeants their trade. Mm-hmm. I did three years at at, uh, at that course as an instructor, and then towards the end uh, as a chief instructor, um, got to go to IOC as a staff sergeant. Um, phenomenal education, and particularly in that time in your career as a staff sergeant. Yeah, um, I learned a lot uh, from the captains. Learned a lot about lieutenants and why they think the things they think. Um, That's gotta be interesting having had that experience. Super, super advantageous. Yeah. I'm like, I know why you think that, and that's a good way to think. I know, I know where you're going with this. Let's adjust this to to what your mission is now. Yeah. And it's a great train, I mean, you can't, I wouldn't trade it for the world, and it's probably why I wanted to be an infra officer anyway, is to get to see if I could do IOC, so I got my cake and eat it too. Yeah. Uh, So after three years at SOI West, at IULC, uh, I got over to the East Coast, Uh, I was a, Cat platoon sergeant and uh, two eight weapons two eight. Oh, that's awesome! I uh, went to Marja uh, with them in eleven. Oh, you went to Marja in eleven with two eight. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Was, okay, so that was that was the it was the heat back then. Yeah. Marja was like once again depends on who you talk to. Right? Yeah. You know? Well, two thousand eleven. Well, so I have my a friends of mine that were in two three that went to Marja went there in two thousand ten into eleven, yeah. and I know some guys that were in one six that went in two thousand ten into eleven. So yeah. it was that was uh that period of time Marja was like the big battle in Afghanistan. I will offer you this. I thought Ramadi in 04 was a lot more dangerous. Than really? Margin 11. No kidding. But, margin 11. But, and just, I mean, there was dangerous. Yeah, yeah. Long. This is all relative. And it's it, yeah, obviously, yeah. Where you're at yeah, that makes and, sense. And maybe, maybe the cat platoon sergeant, so I got gun trucks. Yeah. And, and wrote Ramadi as a rebel squad leader, so I had M16. Much different. Yeah, much yeah, different but, experience for but, sure. But yeah. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so, so did that deployment uh, with, with weapons. Um, Came back, really wanted. To, I wanted to be a gunner. Yeah. Um, but I, I wanted to be a company gunny first. I didn't want to be a battalion gunner who hadn't been a company gunny. Okay. So I, I went to a letter company, uh, did a workup as the company gunny, and then, and then, as we've noted before, I'm not the smartest. I got, I was in zone for first sergeant, oh. and uh, I didn't think I would be anywhere close. Wasn't paying attention, and yeah. And the reason I didn't F is a personal reason, which I will not disclose. Okay. But. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, but it's not necessarily because I want to be a first sergeant. But but anyway, yeah. I got selected a first sergeant, and I got to stay in that company. Um, so I was the company gunny for a year. This is Fox Two Eight. Uh, okay. And uh, and I, I got to be the company gunny, and then they were getting ready to deploy. Uh, depending on the first sergeant, and we did an IT action that I deployed with that company. Went to Leatherneck in thirteen, and uh, my company because uh, we had an extremely talented company commander, extremely talented lieutenants and staff and COs. One of them is a gunner now. Um, we got to do raids, so we were at a Leatherneck. So as the as the as as the AO was was uh, kind of contracting to do the turnover to the Afghan National Army, that did not work. But as we were doing that, yeah, um, we were biding trade space. So so oh, okay. the company did raids, maybe about a dozen or so raids over six months, where you just yes, two pick a spot on the map and you go go kick over the anthill and 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 remove lethal aid from the battlefield, drugs, uh, weapons, ammunition, and if the Taliban come out, which they did every time, you get yeah. a gunfight and then you. You're able to to take a couple of them off the battlefield. You get back on the helicopter, you fly back, you get ice cream and leatherneck. Air raids. That was a good time. Yeah. Air yeah, raids. These these were all. We did Hellborn raids. You could do a ground raid, but I, I would recommend against it. these. Were yeah, especially raids. in in Afghanistan, where it's Coming like IEDs back. everywhere. They're gonna, they're gonna see you coming. Yeah, they're gonna yeah. see you come from a mile away, and then they're gonna like just line the roads. You know, yeah. it's yeah. much these harder. Were, these were all Hellborn raids. Yeah, that's definitely ideal if you're gonna be doing raids at all, especially in that given the specific. Uh, you know, atmospherics to the area at the time. Um, so commissioned out of there. So from, I had a gunner package. When I okay, okay. So, 
Yeah. Okay, makes sense. And then after that piece, you you did wh- where have you served? You said you were a gunner in which unit? Yeah, so I was uh, battalion gunner from three two for just about it. Uh, three two years. Okay. Um, I got uh, I got five months as a uh, regimental gunner, kind of as a placeholder. Well, not kind of as a placeholder. Yeah. But just so a regimental commander wasn't gapped uh, at Eighth Marines. Uh, and then when 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 the actual real regimental gunner showed up, I then went to LAR, second LAR. I was there for nine months. Okay. A uh, great experience. Learned a lot about LAR. Very different from the line. Uh, different, but not very different. I mean, no, no things are new underneath the sun. Yeah. Um, it, just different, but but super enjoyable. Fair enough. Um, and then um, and and then I went to IOC. I was IOC's gunner for about two and a half years. Okay. Uh, just wonderful wonderful experience. Uh, to go back there work with that that team. Yeah. And then uh, and then uh, I've been the sixth Marines gunner for about just coming up just short of four years. So I went from IOC to, to here to regiment. You said four years. Just short of four years. Just short of four years. Yeah. Have you enjoyed your time here at the regiment? That's a it's, a. it's the best regiment in the Marine Corps. <laughs> Six Marines, best regiment in the Marine Corps. Yeah. Uh, but, but honestly, a hundred percent. And and we actually, uh, the one thing I would tell you about Six Marines, at least while I've been here, all four of the battalions are phenomenal. Yeah. And they are they, they they one's coming back from an overseas deployment, one's getting ready to leave on an overseas deployment. Yeah. Um. You know, we're supporting UDPs, but we've got phenomenal commanders, phenomenal gunners, the guys I interact with. Yeah. But the officers, the, the company commanders, we, it's it's a very I, you know, and, and maybe I'm up in the, you know, the command deck. So like I'm looking at rose colored glasses, but yeah. I'm very impressed with our battalions. So, yeah. And the regimental staff, which is part of the regiment, they, they are just phenomenal enablers. Yeah. Um, so you feel confident in their ability to execute whatever mission set do, that they're given? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that gives me hope because I know a lot of people that don't, they don't get to really see like what the infantry is like today. And, you know, obviously everybody's sure. there's like politics, all that nonsense, but yeah. Um, there's, there's a lot of people just don't have an intimate understanding of, of what it is like the standard that people are, are, are at right now, because think like times have changed and everything that's going out in civilian society is very different from us. But, um, that's good to hear that people still feel confident in our, our folks, uh, ability to, to accomplish whatever mission set they're given and that they're prepared for for whatever's coming, yeah, you know, because there's always going to be something coming. We don't necessarily know exactly. We have an idea. We have ideas, right? But, yeah. but uh, yeah. just I mean, being we're prepared. Back thousand, we're going to get it wrong. Like, sure, we have a focus, and we, we got a way to drive. But, but yeah, no, I, I uh, yeah, uh, at least from my fighting hole, at least six Marines in the battalions that that that, that, that we support um, as they deploy and as they train. Like, I mean, nobody's perfect. Everybody's got a lot of work to do. Right? Sure. I it, I've had this happen more than once in combat where. I'm impressed or happy or proud of my unit's performance, and then that typically ends with an RPG or an IED or me losing a Marine. Yeah. So, so if you're feeling happy, you're in the wrong line of work. However, yeah. Objectively, uh, or objectively, as yeah. objective as I can be, I would tell you those those four battalions are are very well prepared. Yeah. Uh, and very well trained. Well, you know, I I have friends that are all scattered, kind of like. Throughout, peppered throughout the regiment, if you will, in in various units, and uh, you know, I've only ever had I've only had one perspective, so um, it's important. It's it's been nice to get different perspectives sure. from other units in different locations, because yeah. like I was obviously Third Marine Division is completely different now than it was when I was there. Um, but then even like the Pendleton units has changed a lot since since like some of my friends, my peers went there when we first got out of ITB and stuff, but. Um, and I mean, the the Marine Corps has been going through so much, so many changes, just with the force redesign and the different mission sets, uh, the withdrawal from Afghanistan, like the different things that we're planning on doing, mm-hmm. and we're shifting gears, we're getting new technology, we're doing different types of training that we've never done before, we're having different types of workups than we've ever done before. Um, a lot's changing, you know, and and to hear from somebody with your your level of experience say that you're confident in in uh, in what we're doing, like that gives me a semblance of, of hope. Well, I Uh, think that, I think that where we, where we get to kind of get confused is we look at technology or we look at a, 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 an operating concept or, or, you know, force design, we look at EABO, we look at those and, and, and change is, is, is good. Yeah. And it's necessary. Right. But it's also probably not as drastic as people think. Yeah. And, 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 you know, what, what I've, what I've heard a, a general officer, right. Who, a general officer, so he's a lot smarter than me, but he's also, you know, a, a gentleman I respect from afar. You know, he said this, and, and I, I it would just say technology is additive at this point. 
So we really, there's a lot of people, maybe they're vendors, maybe they're, they're in think tanks, wherever. And they want it to be like, war is totally transformed by it. Yeah. And I've seen this movie before. You read a book about Korea, because there's nukes, we're never gonna have to fight again. It'll just be, and it's the same thing. Drones, we, you know, small UAS, those are additive. Those have to be incorporated. Yeah. But war is still gonna come down to will. It'll still come, you can watch Ukraine, you can, you can, you can look anywhere. If, if, and I hope we don't have to. Yeah. Um, but if called upon, I know Marines will, will, will succeed. And it's going to involve violence, and it's going to be up close and personal, and it's going to involve small arms and grenades and small UAS. Yeah. And EOBO, you know, perhaps, but but that'll still look, you know, I, what I would tell you is, is the, the patrols I took out in Ramadi in 04, or the patrols I took in Marja in 11, yeah. um, if I talk to a guy, we're in a VFW, if I talk to one of the gentlemen out there who served in Vietnam, and we talked about what we did and how we did it, it would look a lot more, it would look a lot more similar than dissimilar. Yeah, that yeah, that so makes sense. At the end of the day, offense, defense, patrolling, how to fight in an urban environment, how to employ your weapon system, how to be disciplined. I, like it's, it's not. I think it's, it's a lot, a lot uh, more similar than dissimilar. Yeah, makes sense. yeah, no, that makes sense. It does. Well, hey, look, uh, Jeremy, I appreciate you taking the time again today to to share your insight on what it means to be a Marine Corps gunner and like what gunners actually do. Um, I feel like I've learned a lot just because like I've never really gone into an in-depth conversation. I've done a little bit of research because I, I want to have some situational awareness. Right. Uh, but not to the level or to the depth that you uh, were explaining. So I appreciate you taking the time to, to come uh, sit down and provide me with an explanation and an in-depth perspective analysis. And also everybody else out there who may not have known, but might have an interest in it down the road or, or, you know, want to know more about weapon systems or how to design ranges and things like that. Like, cause that's cool stuff to me. Cause I, I mean, I enjoy firearms. I'm sure that a lot of other folks that appreciate the second amendment enjoy firearms. So, um, that's, you know, one of those things that maybe somebody else would have a, an interest in. And hopefully this provides something that is a benefit to people that didn't know before, um, and teaches somebody something. So again, yeah, thanks for your time. And, uh, We'll we'll probably be in touch. I'll try to come around six Marines yeah, and you're, you're more, and you're more, and more. see what a day in the life's like. Yeah, well, I, it's, I, I don't. Once again, battalion gunners work. I I don't do much anymore. But uh, but no, you're you're always welcome. I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, I, I would just um, I would offer uh, that anybody's thinking about you know that that they're thinking about uh, uh, pursuing a, a career path as a Marine gunner that that you know just do well wherever you're at. Like do well wherever you're at, yeah. and then seek out a marine gunner as you get on your career to to have some advice. But but generally speaking, if it's you know it's a small, tiny, tiny population, um, but just you know do well as an infantry marine wherever you're at, um, and then you know if you if you and you said it earlier, right? If you can teach a thing, you can probably do it. Yeah. So those just those just intrinsically they're just linked. Um, yeah. And uh and it, it is it's a hard it, it's a little difficult to get there, but it's it's sure. very rewarding both from a I mean, number one, from professionally, your ability to influence that command, and, and sometimes the entire service, is uh, completely uh, completely above your pay grade. Yeah, but but it is it is it's pretty uh, it's pretty rewarding. It's pretty neat. Yeah, I think I think the the key to success with a lot of these things is just being teachable, you know, because nobody's perfect at anything. I I absolutely not. So like, I have no qualms with asking for help or asking for advice or mentorship. That's that's part of the reason why we got all these salt dogs in like yourself who we can like lean on and be like, Hey, what do you think about this? Or what's your perspective? Or you, have you ever done this before? Or like, and typically nine times out of 10, they're like, yeah, yeah. Hey, well here, let me talk about this. I've done this before over here, this area, this back in this day or whatever, you know? So yeah. But then, again, I appreciate the, uh, I appreciate your time and I appreciate the insight and I appreciate the, uh, the perspective. And, and uh, I think a lot of people are going to benefit. So thanks. Awesome. Hope all right. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. Appreciate it.